Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this panel. Um, I'm a medieval historian, uh, not particularly versed into programming, uh, but I'm part of this very uh, ambitious uh, project, uh, this synod, uh, where we study um, religious dissident cultures and inquisition uh, by applying computational methods. And today I will talk about the project I'm currently working on, so I'll be very happy to hear your feedback at the end of my uh, presentation. Um, we observed uh, that the opponents of trials end up incriminating someone in most cases. And what are the factors uh, behind uh, this behavior? Is it mainly the pressure exercised um, from the authority, or are there also uh, social factors at play? This is what I will present today after a brief introduction on the context and the source, and uh, we will see some examples of how we worked through a specific methodology that used SNA techniques in order to tackle this research uh, question. Our source are inquisitorial registers, uh, records of the trials of people accused of being heretics or somehow implied in religious dissident matters. There is a rich historiographical debate over the nature of these sources. I, uh, I would sum up here uh, this twofold nature by saying that uh, Inquisition records uh, tell us in detail the relations between people who uh, did what, with whom, uh, where and when, and, um, and the content and circumstances of the interactions. Uh, we retrieved this information from the answers that people uh, gave to the inquisitors when interrogated, answers that were carefully transcribed uh, by notaries. Uh, but this said, uh, we do need uh, to remember another aspect, uh, that this type of document is written by the authority. The questions asked are chosen and formulated by them with the purpose of repression, and so, in our analysis, we need to take into account both the role of inquisitors and dissidents, uh, authority and, uh, and defendants. If registers, on the one hand, are privileged sources for the study of social and religious uh, history of the people under investigation, they're also a product of the authority and can help us studying the exercise of power and social control. So to consider their multifaceted nature, we should look at them as products of interaction. Um, they recorded trials and uh, investigations. We get information on participants, places, and the content of specific interactions, uh, but also information on the actions and the choices made uh, by the actors at trial, so inquisitors and uh, dissidents. Um, for this study, uh, we are in a specific context in northern central Italy at the turn of the 14th century. And the tribunal of the Inquisition in Bologna is dealing with two dissident religious um, cultures, Cathars and uh, Apostles. Now, briefly, uh, regarding Cathars, uh, most of them were not originally from the city of Bologna, and uh, Catharism never became a political and social force that could uh, challenge uh, the church. Uh, defendants uh, were mostly older people who fell back into their own beliefs and activities and were tried um, again. They had the sympathy and support of a strong network of people within the city, but lacked uh, political support. And these elements, uh, together with the fragmentation of the movement, uh, prevented its survival. And then the register that I work on, after the year 1300, only reports of apostles, uh, whose heresy was understood as a phenomenon that spread mostly in the rural areas between Modena and Bologna, where the followers of this movement would travel, preaching evangelical poverty and penance, and would meet supporters in private houses. Uh, many followers of apostles uh, were uh, especially among those people that normally were denied access to the religious sphere, such as light tea, women, and the unlettered. And by the end of the 13th century, uh, persecution started to strike harder, and uh, inquisitors would start investigating and leading campaigns to uncover the networks around 
these full-time members, the traveling preachers, and also to eradicate uh, these movements from the, from the territory. Um, I'm showing here a map of central northern Italy uh, with the centers that appear in the register, either recorded as provenance of people, uh, residents, or places where events mentioned in interrogations have happened. You see the concentration of activities in the city of Bologna and in the centers close by, and uh, also in southern Alps and near uh, Garda Lake, which were important Kaffir centers and the places of provenance of many Kaffir is active in uh, Bologna. Um, Data-wise, we have 922 documents contained in this uh, early 14th century manuscript. Um, this um, show different kinds of, of genres. We have the depositions of people, but also uh, the sentences and other kind of legal documents, such as consultations of lawyers over specific cases. and. Um, and so on. And um, we collected the data by storing in Google Sheet tables uh, the people involved, uh, the locations, and the trial events with accuser, accused, types of pressure exercised on the defendant, all information that the texts of the register uh, provide us. Uh, briefly regarding the data coverage. Um, we considered in the analysis every person involved as someone who incriminated or was incriminated. So we have 655 people uh, forming over 1,000 ties. We have uh, 184 deponents, but not all of them uh, were tried. Uh, those uh, were 150. And then we also noticed that uh, women were underrepresented. So um, how did investigations work? Um, to have a lead to follow, the inquisitor had to gather more information about people. It could employ various methods to get people talking, but then there might have been reasons uh, related to their social standing or kinship relations for people to collaborate or less with the inquisitorial authority. So we will look at the factors that are more relevant in the outcomes of the trials. And uh, here I'm showing uh, the network around a person. We see Boom Petrus um, here in the center and, um, and the people that he named a trial and their connections in terms of incriminations. So we see a fairly interconnected uh, network where people clearly um, knew each other and it looks like a community. Um, let's see how we get to reconstruct uh, these relations. Um, this is an excerpt from one of the depositions of Pompetrus, a respected man but highly implicated as a heretic uh, since he was already involved in a trial in the past. And here in Bologna in 1299, he first did not appear when summoned by the Inquisitor, and so once found, he was incarcerated and tried. Uh, we see from the text that he tells us of um, people. We see the very uh, close uh, family members of this uh, Johannes, his wife and, uh, and their, um, their sons. Uh, we're told that they are uh, believers, uh, that they met heretics. We know where as well and what they did. Uh, they shared good and they adored them. And I want to stress here that just from this fragment, uh, there are already many elements that the Inquisitor could gather uh, to continue and broaden this uh, investigation. Um, here I have a graphic representation of the full network of incriminations. We reconstructed five different stages uh, that you see in different colors. One is missing uh, because we had a stage that did not uh, generate any accusation, which is a quite rare case. We have in total uh, 32 components. Many are very small and involve just two to three people. We have the largest one with 397 uh, people, which uh, connects, also, connects also uh, three different stages. And uh, we could also notice the one uh, shown on top right. 
Um, we also have brokers. These uh, black dots are um, people who wait more in the network, those who connected uh, the stages. And now, uh, keeping in mind these two larger components that I mentioned, um, turning at this graph, uh, we find them as the peak of activity of the tribunal. So uh, between 1299 and 1300 and 1304 Here, I'm showing a scatter plot uh, to look at the distribution of incriminations. We have on the um, X as, uh, axis um, the in degree of people, so the accusations received, and the X, uh, the O degree, so uh, the number of accusations uh, made. Um, the position of each dot on, the, on these two axes indicate the values for an individual data point. And each dot here uh, represents a person uh, with the sex uh, distinguished uh, by color. And then we have this diagonal darker line, which uh, indicates those who have a balance in sending and uh, receiving accusations. Um, so looking at it, uh, those appearing on top left uh, have I out degree and low to no in degree. We see a person who accuses almost 75 uh, people. Then there's someone on the top right. Uh, those will be those who both accuse and are accused by uh, many people. And it's usually the case of those uh, members of the movements who would uh, travel around the territory preaching and getting support uh, from people. And next, I want to show in detail a few major incrimination patterns. Um, so someone with a high uh, degree uh, who's on top of this plot on the left and someone with a high in degree. Uh, the first agonet here is on a bene, an older man, a Catholic who recalls events that took place up to 40 years uh, beforehand. Uh, he names uh, 72 people, all from past interactions and uh, travels. So uh, none of them are actually tried. So uh, this stays a network of only out degree with incriminations starting from him. The second case is someone who only receives incrimination. Um, someone has high in degree when he is accused by many. In this context, we have um, a priest accused by many religious brothers. And in Bologna, uh, it's often the case of people that made enemies, such as money lenders, who uh, would look like this uh, egonet. And I have a third one um, because I wanted to observe a phenomenon that is typical in social interaction networks. So triangles, uh, which tell us about how people cluster. Uh, here we have someone uh, incriminating another person or a group of people who then incriminate uh, someone else and uh, closes the triangle uh, by incriminating the same person or vice uh, versa. And so it is quite likely that all these people were co-involved or were part of the same community. Um, I would note that uh, there is not uh, much higher reciprocity in Bologna. Um, which can tell us that the Inquisitor had an incomplete image of the network, either because he lacked the resources to conduct a deeper investigation, or he was simply not interested in investigating some people, or um, even the opponents uh, didn't give uh, testimony for protections or limitations of memory. And let's look at one of the major incriminations factors. Um, so inquisitorial pressure, which was um, systematically recorded in the registers. Uh, we differentiated uh, between psychological and physical, and then we further divided. The first level of pressure is for people to be summoned uh, by the inquisitor, usually when you already had information about them. And then people could be called more than once to the post, uh, because the Inquisitor wasn't happy with the first version he was given by them, or because he knew they had more information that they did not disclose. 
And lastly, we have financial pledges. So we have people asked to give a security their own property or person. Uh, but this in Bologna was implemented in very few cases and for people already quite implicated. Then uh, physical pressure, um, here literature has been observing how this would be reserved only to the most extreme cases. Incarceration was deployed only for those who had been hunted down by the agents of the Inquisitor or for someone who was so implicated they feared he would flee before being sentenced. And this is often the case of people found to be engaging in heretical acts after being sentenced already in the past. And this uh, would lead to the handing over to the secular arm and thus um, condemnation. Then torture is recorded only uh, for three people. Um, and here we see that the Inquisitor always asks uh, the Concilium Sapientum, this gathering of experts in law, um, for, the, for the Studium of Bologna for advice uh, before actually implementing it. So uh, we have generated a box plot to show that pressure worked, uh, that those subject to pressure gave generally many more names than those not subjected to pressure. Uh, if we look at the box indicating no pressure, we do see very little variation in incrimination. It is condensed. Um, the maximum and the third quartile are overlapping, meaning that uh, there is a large proportion of identical and low values in the data set. So we would think that people not pressured would go and give one or two names uh, to the inquisitor as a very targeted action. While on the other hand, uh, people subjected to pressure are more spread out and the third quartile and maximum. And we see also outliers uh, raising to high numbers. And um, can look more in detail at one type of pressure. Uh, we show here male and uh, female deponents who appeared once uh, on the um, left. And, uh, and women and, uh, and men summon more than once. Um, and what we're able to observe is, uh, first, that being called multiple times increases the likelihood of giving uh, more names. People deposing more times did yield uh, visibly more incriminations, as we see with both uh, female and males on the right, with these extending uh, box plots compared to the figures on the left. And then we can observe also that first the positions of women have a smaller uh, distribution compared to men. Um, the condensed figure on the left um, shows that there is little variation in how many uh, people, female uh, single-time opponents, incriminate. And then things change uh, with uh, multiple depositions. Already opponents have uh, the median value lower with more value showing in the uh, for the quartile and the maximum. So women, just as men, once we're deposing, uh, do uh, give more names. Um, lastly, um, we observed another factor, uh, the one of social closeness or assortativity, which indicates the tendency of people to connect to similar others. Um, here, I will specify that uh, these values take into consideration only diets, so couples sharing the same characteristic. So we see that we have full coverage for sex and kinship, uh, while residents and occupation have lower matching diets. But um, looking at the results, uh, we see something uh, surprising. For instance, sex, which is moderately assortative, um, shows a, a number that is higher in the other uh, registers that we um, studied. And indeed, we do not expect uh, people to incriminate only those of the same sex, because these communities were uh, mixed and heresy was not uh, gendered. Also for kinship, we would expect a lower number, um, not that people would incriminate people, someone from the same uh, kin. Uh, close kinship is connected with protective behavior, so you should have a lower assortative coefficient uh, than other factors of close social closeness. Um, this means that pressure played a toll. People were forced, threatened by the inquisitor, to disclose the involvement of their familiars as well. Then for 
residents and occupations, uh, we don't have the full coverage, but we see that there is a fairly high level of assertivity uh, for people sharing residence and occupation. So they tend to name people closer to them socially and geographically. And quickly wrapping up, um, as we've seen, most people incriminated someone else. We have 97% of the opponents who give at least one name. And so we wanted to further inquire into this. Uh, we focused on the pressure exercised by the authority, and we've seen how relevant was the role it played on the suspects, uh, both psychological pressure and physical, even though this was used very seldomly and in cases where people were already very involved or failed to appear in court uh, once summoned. And, um, and then last, yes, we, we have a higher assertivity than expected for sex and, um, and kinship, um, uh, but as well as uh, residents and, um, and occupation. And um, I thank you. I end here my presentation.